Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. As usual, let us start with Om Nam, seven times the mantra of the universe in its purity. <coughs> establishing the wheel of the karma. And uh, last time, we talked about the individual, how it works individually, how you can recognize your situation, learn from it, start to practice, attain some clarity, use that to change your karma, and become a clearer, better, more bodhisattva-minded person. Or, as it goes counter to this, you can become attached to something any of the five poisons, think that you have some magic, then you have to experience its emptiness, it crashes on you, then you learn the experience of becoming free from it, and then you have the cause and effect wisdom and you come back you know, to the seemingly same point as you started with. That was the individual last time. And now we take a look at the groups. How group society, how societies on this earth work and what is the principle of their foundation and also their downfall because as we pointed out at the first you know Dharma talk without money fame sex food and sleep human society wherever it is on this earth does not function we have also established if we take too much of it any of this and become attached to this it works counter to its original purpose that means making people happy holding things together establishing relationships all the five foundations are relative they are unstable they are subject to causes and conditions they're subject to impermanence and imperfection our mistake is whether an individual or a group when we believe that any of these five can be absolute in their nature, that they would last forever, that they would be perfect, and they would not depend on other people or other factors in life. And because of that, we suffer. Not just as an individual, but also as a group. Europe has seen quite a lot of cultures, societies, appearing and disappearing. The Orient has been a lot more stable in the last 2,000 years. I often thought of the Roman Empire. What was it that really made it appear? And then in a few hundred years, less than a thousand years, made it disappear. The foundation was by two brothers, Romulus and Remus. And out of the first name Romulus came the name Roma, or Rome. And the foundation was some really strong and balanced together action between people. The Latin tribes that wanted to make first a city, then a country, and a whole empire. They had everything under their group's control. Religion, finance, politics, all matters of community within the city, and later on foreign relationships which largely consisted of conquests. So when they started to become bigger, 
the leadership became more powerful, so more power, more fame, and more money appeared. And as the centuries went on and on and on, the leadership became richer, more powerful, had better and more food than the others. And I'm simplifying this so that we could fit it into our usual timeline and observe similarities between other cultures and empires. So at the beginning, there was a principle that united everybody. There was a roughly balanced you know, structure of society. As time went on and they became more efficient, more powerful, accumulated more material wealth and power, and also religious influence, inequalities rose. The balanced structure became more elevated, like a huge tower on top of which there is the leadership, whether it's financial, political, or religious. And then there's a big distance between them and everyday people. And finally, when this distance became so vast, that there was virtually no real connection, no meaningful connection between the plebs, the people, and the aristocrats, then there were two worlds in the empire. One, that the top one, two, three, four, five percent experienced. And then the other, which was experienced by 70, 80, 90, and 95 percent of the populace. What's really interesting that this kind of disproportionate distribution of all the five things that we have talked about so far contributed greatly to the downfall of the empire. And what happened after that, that we had almost a thousand years of the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages when, you know, in the 14th, 15th century, the Renaissance came. And until then, what did we have in Europe? We had a very strong religious structure. Every state based its existence on some Catholic and much, much later into the Renaissance Protestant doc doctrine. And that religious doctrine was shoring up the state, giving its raison d'etre, the reason for its existence, and as it started on the ruins of the Roman Empire, it started with a very kind of balanced structure, but the priests, they became very powerful. The kings and the knights and everybody in the upper layer became very quickly, in a matter of decades, very powerful. And in a few hundred years again, something happened, which we can call double perception or double reality, the way the top 10% of society saw it, and the way the lower 90% saw it. And that's why when people wanted their own experience of reality back, they wanted to have a more balanced society, then the French Revolution created three words. Fraternity, equality, or being equal, and freedom. So these three words are the key words of modern society. So again, we had a third big start in Europe in the 17th, 18th century, especially in the 19th after the French Revolution. And that was the foundation of modern society with these three key words. And they reimported the idea of Greek democracy, as we remembered, as we could pull it out of the drawer. So the last 200 years, basically, was based on these three words, being equal, being free, and being brothers and sisters on the basis of humanity, that we have the same human nature. This human nature was just a clear human sentiment, nothing transcendental, nothing like Buddha nature. But it was good enough to start a new way of relating to each other. So again, one or two hundred years pass, and we reach the 20th century, and somehow these concepts began to quickly erode and disappear, and Europe made two world wars within 50 years. And 150 years before, we had these three words as the new civilization. In fact, the sense of 
fresh start was so strong that in France they started a new time counting. Just like when Jesus was born, new time counting or reckoning began. And in 1793, when they completely killed the French ruling class, starting in 1793, they started a new year counting. With Napoleon, it disappeared within 20 years, but they had such a strong, fresh start. It was the third big start in Europe. So when that kind of inequality became apparent in the 20th century, what was the response? The response was communism. And it started almost 100 years ago in Russia, after a little gestation period in Paris and you know, Switzerland, Russian intelligentsia brought it back to Russia and they created a new equality and a new society called communism. This lasted even shorter. This lasted only like 70, 80 years, depending on where you go. In my country, it disappeared in 1990 because what happened is that the communist elite became too powerful, too greedy, too selfish, just like the other elites before. And that's why society had to collapse, because those that were supposed to take responsibility, have some wisdom and compassion, they used their position only to be more famous, more powerful, get better food, get more beautiful women or men, whatever they wanted, and get more rest, more sedentary life, and they lost their sense of responsibility towards others. So communism had to disappear, and it started to disappear, you know, like 30 years ago. But in some parts of the world, including a little north of here, it's still there. Or in Cuba, it's still there. So the next one is happening right now. Because you see how the Western financial elite started to burn and melt the system down for their own short-term benefits, starting many times starting since 1960, but it became very clear in 2007 and 8. You remember that. How the American banks, insurance companies, etc. had to be bailed out, and now the same thing is happening in Europe. If you watch what kind of decisions they are making right now, this is the time when you can see whether we, as a Western civilization, survive financially and politically or not. So it's not just an individual's behavior in terms of the five desires, what's very important. It's important for your life. But look at countries, look at cultures, look at civilizations, what they think of as most important. And whatever they are attached to, whatever they become obsessed with, that is the cause of their downfall. So Rome became obsessed with an empire, a physical, flesh and blood empire, and the SPQR, the Senatus Populus Romanus, just expanded to the known boundaries of the world. And that obsession was their downfall. In the Middle Ages, these states were obsessed with being fervently religious. They waged countless wars, including the Crusades. And that religious, I would say, fanatic behavior was their downfall because that's how science could take over. That's why science was born in Europe because that religious sentiment in the Dark Ages took away your direct experience of your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. And that's why Giordano Bruno had to burn at the stake and not just him but others. That's why Galileo Galilei suffered and he had to withdraw his teachings. But before he died he said, yet it moves, et pur si move. Okay? Because he couldn't deny his own experience. That was the start of the enlightened era in Europe, of course. This sense of enlightenment is in the Western sense. So what we are seeing right now in 2008, 9, 12, etc., and it will go on for a few more years, is a huge paradigmatic change in the West when the obsession with money and power, especially with money, has to change. Because if that doesn't change, it becomes the cause of downfall in the West. So they could defend it in 2008 with huge losses. In fact, the American middle class really took a big blow and started to severely diminish because 
of the financial burdens that they had. Suddenly, everything became different. Remember last time you talked about the, the apple, the apple metaphor? How everybody can get an apple for a very short time, and it becomes so fast, 24 times a second, it changes hands, just one apple, then everybody seems to have an apple in their hands. And you can borrow against the illusion. An illusion as collateral doesn't work. So when that illusion disappears, the whole scheme collapses, and all these three-letter financial constructions, CDOs, CFOs, you know, SIDs, and all these, they just disappear, vanish. So illusion impairs reality. Fake money takes real money. Your savings, your work, everything just goes out of the window because the elite was thinking only for their short-term benefit. By this, I'm just trying to point out, it's not the first and not the last time in history when this thing happens. But it always happens differently. It always happens in a different you know, way, seemingly in a different way. But the patterns are eerily similar. Whether it's here, or on the Easter Islands, or in the Maya Empire, they had a shortage of water, and what did they do? The Mayans had their own downfall because of the shortage of water. And they just couldn't pull it together. Their obsession with their own ideas of religion, empire, etc., etc., these ideas killed the true community spirit. In the last couple of years, you know, horrible things happened over there. And the empire disappeared by the 10th, 11th century. I'm saying these things so that you would be aware of the typical cycles, the typical repeated patterns of our society. We are not living in some terrible apocalyptic times. We have been doing this for a long time. But now we are in a crossroads. So you can see for yourself. You don't need a prophet or some soothsayer or some astrologer to tell you what's coming. You can just use your common sense. So the quality of our consciousness, the, co the quality of our collective mind is low compared to the amount of people and the severity of the problems that we are facing right now. So either we improve our quality or our quantity as human beings will be reduced. Not by some external threat, by ourselves. Just the way there was at least a century and a half of bloody, chaotic rule in the Roman Empire's you know, last death throes. Just like in the Middle Ages, there was a lot of suffering, and before the Renaissance came, it was really, really heavy and, and terrible for people, especially in the 11th and 12th century. During the Crusades in Europe, everybody suffered. People paid for that war, just like you know, the West pays for the current wars in Iraq. Afghanistan and, and all these places and people sometimes don't see the connection now they are related but when we talk about the five desires which become five poison the attachment to money fame sex food and sleep all these attachments at a large scale at a group scale point to a very clear dynamics how the civilization or culture can rise sustain itself for some time and fall down and start again seemingly in a different way but following the same mind pattern just to repeat it in a few decades see communism a few centuries see modern society or a whole millennium almost like the Roman Empire so what is our job once you see the predicament that you are alone or just uh, you know, very few people you start another movement another activism another political revolution another financial scheme probably not why you may ask come on we know better than any other time before we have the tradition we have the teachers we have you know, more enlightened consciousness than before don't delude yourself you cannot create a perfect society that would last and would be relatively independent. Remember the three marks of existence? Impermanence, interdependence, and imperfection. The three I's. Okay. That will never stop. As long as we are in this kind of human body, with this kind of human mind, we have these three marks of existence. So the only thing we can do is wake up from it, 
and help each other at a much smaller scale than it could become empire, political pattern, financial establishment. Because whatever we have outside, it will be imperfect, it will be impermanent, and it will always be interdependent with something or someone that you cannot control. So our job is to wake up and become become not just detached from it, but use the whole existence, the whole fact of life in such a way that would help others wake up. And then, like we've pointed out before, the five poisons can become the five kinds of medicine. You can help this process with the correct relationship, the correct attention, with correct wisdom, you know. All of these can be transformed into something really, really beneficial. But for that, our views have to change. And if we don't change our views, our actual performance or karma as human beings will also remain in the same pattern. So the Buddha and all the great teachers, whether they lived in the West or the East, they didn't teach a certain doctrine that you have to follow. That came later. They taught the way to see. In Sanskrit, vidya. The avidya is ignorance. And it's related to the five desires, but vidya, to see, to wake up, that was the teaching of all the great minds that ever incarnated on this planet. Because that's the only way to change things. But first we have to change ourselves. Ask the right questions, and then we get the right answers. And then we get the right solutions. Which is not attached to a certain pattern, political, financial, religious framework, but it's based on an enlightened human consciousness that can adapt very clearly to circumstances and find a correct direction to reduce suffering on this earth and create a more awakened society. We can all do this. We can all do this. It does not depend on anything and anybody initially because we have what we call the capability of awakening, Buddha nature, Chandra's true self. You can call it in many ways, but whatever looks with your eyes right now and listens with your ears right now and processes all this with your mind right now, that's it. In this moment, at this time, in this place. That's what we need to use because we have nothing else. That's all we've got. But that's powerful enough initially that we could make a meaningful change in our lives first through ourselves, through our change, and then helping others do something <coughs> So ladies and gentlemen, this is as much as I would have liked to say for an introduction. And I hope that the five talks now, whoever listened to all the five or just a few of them, now make sense. How we started and where we got. And now I would like to welcome your questions. Any kind of question is good. You don't have to have previous knowledge. And least of all, you would have to be a Buddhist or a religious person. So feel free to ask any questions you may have. It's warm and everybody's a little sleepy. <laughs> but let me just kind of shake it up a little bit with the notion that there may not be tea time. There may not be any opportunity to ask informal questions over Kimba. So whatever you have in your mind, ask right now. Yes, Crystal. Please grab the mic. Mic to Java
They cannot help you to win what? They can. They cannot help you win. They cannot help me. Uh, yeah, first of all, we have to come back to reality as it is. And the sad part of life on this earth is that uh, we are individually responsible for so many things when we want others to share this responsibility, including our personal belongings or our relationships, things that we would like that would be kind of granted, it would be provided that some of our very precious relationships will not turn their backs on us and there is no special reason, but they do. We don't see the reason, they do. So when that happens, it's a sense of infinite loss. Or when you lose something really important, which is very hard to replace, then you're at a loss. But probably we can agree that the human loss is much greater than the material loss. Material loss can be easily replaced. Even if it's a very large amount of money or something very precious, like a diamond ring, it's just name and form. But the human loss, when you lose somebody's trust, friendship, love, loyalty, it's very hard to get it back. So human loss is just terrible because that takes you to hell. That takes you to this sense of totally being isolated hopeless, helpless. So I'm not telling you how we can avoid it, because we cannot. You cannot avoid these losses. I mean, all of us in this room, except maybe him over there, are old enough to have suffered enough losses. We are. And we know we cannot avoid them. But what can we do to shorten the time of grief and despair? First of all, we have to see the nature of these losses, why they came. The nature of these losses actually teach us how reality works, what we are really made of as human beings, and that's why there's the saying that suffering is the mother of the Buddhas. But out of suffering, it's not evident that everybody gets enlightenment. If it was, human beings would have been enlightened a long time ago, because we suffered so much for many, many millennia. But only when you have the right teaching next to suffering, then there is a chance of awakening. It's, we talked about wars so many times. So if war by itself would be a good reminder of what we are, what reality is, and why we are on this earth, after the first war, there would have been nothing more, just peace. But it seems that we repeat it over and over <coughs> and over again because we have not woken up from that particular suffering. And it's not just war, it's other losses, other conflicts. So, I will tell you a paradox which will help you. There is no logical explanation. But if you want to get, you have to give first. And with immaterial things, it's easier to see. You want to be somebody's friend. And you want that person to be friendly with you. What do you have to do? Yeah, first give friendship. First give some affection. First give some love to that person. And when that happens, you can maybe expect, it's not evident, that if the inyan, the interaction is good, then you get some of it back. But funnily enough, we can always perceive when somebody wants to invest in you. And when they want to invest in you, you see there's something not sincere. Why is this person treating me so well? Why is this person giving me this smile and this handshake? Something is not real. What is not real is that there is a sense of giving and taking. There is a sense of, I'm giving you friendship, so you have to give some friendship back, and then we did good human business. We know it's fake. We know that we don't want this. Because in critical times, you cannot depend on that person. You cannot rely on that person. Either there's some genuine, unconditional, trustworthy relationship, which holds in all situations. If, if you're sick, I'm there. 
If you disappear, I go to the North Pole to find you. If you don't have money, even if I have just man on, I share, I give you what you want. All, all kinds of unconditional, compassionate actions like that. When you have that proof, it's the greatest of all. So that's why material losses can be easily replaced. Human losses, very hard. When you lose this specific human nature of the relationships, and it becomes tied to, to circumstances, conditions, it becomes some kind of business, etc. Then it, then it becomes something really, really sad. And it's not just human relationships that can lose, because we talk about losses, losses that teach. But even your spiritual practice can become some empty form, some kind of business-like worship, that I worship some being, and I want that being to help me, and that's where it ends. Worship is not bad. I'm, I'm really, really thankful that I was taught, and I'm keep, I, I keep being taught what is this tradition, that I can see the Choharu, I can see all the Bosa names and the Bosa names and everybody, you know, doing the Shinju Kido, reciting the Yakchang and that's very clear worship. It's a very clear desire for protection. But it doesn't stop there. There's always one more step. There's always the Panyashimya and the Heart Sutra at the very end. And that takes away the giving and taking. If you look at the Diamond Sutra in that sense, it tells you originally, if you treat all appearances as non-appearances, then you do not depart from your true self. That view itself is proven. So take all the gains as something that you haven't gained. Take all the losses as something you haven't lost. If you do the two together, you become immensely strong inside. Everybody's happy when they get something. And everybody's unhappy when they lose something. But if you treat gains as something you haven't gained, you know, just, it's just there for your use. You can use it for some time, but not forever. When we die, we lose everything, it seems. But we also become free from this incarnation as it was. So if you treat gains as not gain, if you treat losses as not losses, just simply appearance and disappearance, then you are closer to reality as it is, closer to the way things are, closer to the just like this nature, the suchness of this universe. You see, when it rains, the sky doesn't say to the trees and the forest, I want 10% back. Right? Sunshine doesn't have a tax. If it did, we would have a problem. You know? So, if you look at truly the way things are and the way mind works, then you can save yourself from a lot of unhappiness because your projections are gone. Don't expect that the world will always treat you right or in the way you want to be treated. When you truly get rid of your projections, your aversions, your desires, your own views, and you begin to see things and people as they are, then there will be less of these false gains and false losses. So then you spare yourself from a lot of suffering, and you spare also those people from suffering who are dependent on you. And that's even more important. So spare all humans that are related to you from all the suffering that you experience and naturally will transmit to them. That's our job as practitioners, not just individual salvation. More questions? Yeah. It's okay, just speak into the microphone because it goes into the camera and we don't hear it, we just hear your voice. Good.
because right now in my situation, I'm unhappy and also I feel like I'm making others unhappy as well. So I can't tell what I'm doing and what I should do. I can't tell whether this is something I should endure or I, I should just be here. Let me ask you, what's your purpose or direction in life? are very sincere intentions, but yet you experience suffering. Yes. Why? Why you cannot follow and realize these very appreciable and wonderful goals? What's in between the reality that you experience right in your mind? The reality that you experience and the reality you want to experience. What's the distance? What's the hindrance? First in your mind, oh, mind first. Well, the, um, the reason why I feel that I'm suffering is because I feel that I'm in an unfair situation where I just believe that I would only study and be able to study, but there are some unnecessary works that I have to do. and which I feel that is very unfair, not because I'm doing the unnecessary work, but because... Okay. So, injustice is one very strong motivating factor to our practice. Without injustice, without being threatened in our righteousness, we would never enter the path. So. This level of unfairness, and I'm not marginalizing your situation, is very different from like one third of the world's situation where you don't have enough food to eat, where you don't have enough water to drink, where you have absolutely no savings and you're living day by day, and a significant portion of this kind of lowers 30% in terms of affordability, and they are persecuted for various reasons. Either because they are oil, or they have a certain religion, or they have certain other, you know, causes and conditions that, you know, puts them into this fragile, really unfair and really injustice type of situation. So, if you look at yourself, and you start with yourself, which is always easier than fixing the world, it seems more difficult at first, but you realize that you cannot fix the world, but you can fix yourself. So, what you think you are, and what you truly are, is different. What you think the world is, and what the world actually is, are different. What you think the world should treat you like, and what the world actually treats you like, therefore, are different. So go back to the root cause. The root cause is that your perception of self and the world are different from the way you truly are and the world truly is. No. If you saw cause and effect clearly, you could also see first why did all this is happening to you. So you wouldn't just see the suffering, you would see the cause of suffering also. In line with that, you would see the end of suffering and you would also see the way to end suffering. So your view wouldn't be this stuck view I'm treated unfair, there's injustice in my life. Yeah, that's all, that's all true. We all suffer from that. We are human beings and we cannot avoid this. We, we live in an imperfect society. But you wouldn't see just that. It's 25%. It's the Sassong Jai. It's the Four Noble Truth. So don't just see the suffering. See the cause of it. See the end of it. See the way to end it. But the way to end it requires a life direction. Because that's where your compass is pointing. So you want to be a smart person, a good mother, a happy person, but may I suggest that you put above all this the way, the way that will help you attain all this that you want. So the way to 
actually do this is go deeper in yourself and truly perceive what you are and not get stuck at your emotions, your thoughts, your external situation, etc. But go a little deeper and attain this clear mind, which is beyond situation, beyond condition, beyond good and bad beyond life and death eventually, but it's a pretty big step. If we just become absolutely clear about our lives in this moment, and without any illusions, projections, dualistic distortions, we see this moment clearly, that's pretty good. And there's always one more step, but don't be a maximist. We are not. After we failed a long time, after we have had certain failures you know, re repeatedly, they don't become a maximist, you just want to clean up the mess. That's all. And that's big enough. So when youngsters, especially in the West, they ask, how should I start? I say usually, clean up your room. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly it's a mess. <laughs> so, in terms of this, I don't start with the room where you live in. The Orient, it's your heart, it's your emotions, and your whole complexity and subtlety of your relationships with other people. Make it more simple, make it more clear. Number one, then this kind of intricate web of who says what, who does what, how does it strike me, how does it relate to others that relate to me, it's hugely complex. We are living in the Orient here. So, in that sense, make it simple, make it clear. Next, see your function. Originally, life doesn't have to be suffering. This world is just like this. The, the sky is just blue. The trees are just green. And if you go out without an umbrella, out of the clear blue sky, suddenly there is a cloud. It becomes gray. Just like yesterday, we had some final blessing of rain. And if you're not prepared, then you get soaking wet in the street, drenched to the skin. And people don't like that. But the sky and the rain has nothing to do with it. You do because you didn't take your umbrella. So if you see it from this angle, the sky is just doing sky's job. The tree is just doing tree's job. The dogs barking do dog's job. But do we human beings understand our job? Many times we don't. That's why we don't fit in. Originally, we really don't belong here. This earth functions differently from our usual mental tendencies, and that's why we have so many problems. So, without taking it too far, set your goal just higher than a happy life, because you have to attain what gives you that happy life. And that is not outside, that's inside. If you attain that source, you can go beyond your problems more easily. Okay. I just want to keep this, keep the pure mind of a child, even if, even when I get old, uh, and plus some wisdom too, so I w will get through some uh, things that might not be so pleasant. But 
until now, until these days, I kept that wish for myself. But just this few months, uh, I met some people, uh, including you, that sh they sh uh, they showed me about what is being a true adult, which I felt that hmm, so being a being adult an adult is not so bad thing at all. I mean. That's how I began to feel, and now I want to. I am feeling to become what a true grown up is. So I want to ask you: uh, Would you be kind to tell us what you think about what a true adult is? What is being a true adult? True adult means that you were slapped many times in life, and you not only survived, but you actually got some wisdom out of it. You already know you cannot keep child's mind. <coughs> Being attached to any kind of mind immediately puts you to hell. Why? Because you can't keep it. You want to stay a child forever? You become totally and absolutely lunatic with that thought. It becomes an obsession. It's infantile behavior. You can't keep it. You know, in some other parts of the world, people want to be adults so quickly. They want to be, you know, powerful in all respects, you know, grow up very quickly and earn money, have family, have fun, very, very quickly, but then they don't want to get old. So as if they were 24 for the rest of their lives. So it doesn't. So can you just stay a true adult once you know what it is? Of course not, because you become old and then you die. And everybody then dies. And don't worry about it. It happens because it has to happen. And if you're not attached to mind and body, it's not so bad. Okay. If we are, we so. Okay. so when you see how great masters pass on, you know that there are many ways. You know, I have wonderful monk friends in Wolchongsa and Wondo. There's an Amsterdam's Nirvana picture. He was in full Kasa Changsam, sitting in lotus position. And then one moment, and they photographed that moment, his head just went up, finished. That's it. He left. So nobody said, oh, he died, oh my gosh. You know, it was very clear. He knew his time. And not just Buddhist culture, in many countries, also other indigenous cultures, or those people who were close to nature, they perceive, sometimes three days, one week, or even a month, great masters, you know, sometimes they set to go to and prepare, in six months I'm gone. <laughs> and then one week before, you know, I said, okay, not so much food anymore, have a drink. They sat down, tree, room, wherever they wanted, a few more days, few, few more hours, and they were gone. So you attach to child's mind, you cannot grow up. You are attached to adult's mind, you cannot die. And if you cannot die, you cannot be reborn again. Death is not just separation from the body. Death also means that everything is gone. Everything. Your idea of self, your existence, whatever you knew, you felt, you remember, you wanted, it's all gone, it's finished. So when your mind separates from the body, leave everything behind, everything. And at least for a split of a second, experience complete freedom. Then your karma catches you. So, how to be a correct person? Let's say a person, whether you are halfway into adulthood, or halfway into being an old person. How to be a correct person? So. Keep your mind clear. Return to the mind which is before child, before adult, before birth, old age, sickness and death. That mind is clear like space, clear like a mirror. It functions flawlessly in this moment. And if you attain and keep that mind, you're not attached to anything because it has nothing in it that you could be attached to. Yet, although it's infinite like space, it is clear like a mirror. And in this mirror, 
you see everything. You see clearly, hear clearly, taste, smell, touch, and act clearly. And then you always perceive your correct situation, correct relationship, and correct function. Very simple. So don't attach to child, don't attach to adult, don't attach to life and death. Don't attach to anything, okay? Then correct life and death possible. More questions? Generally, uh, especially me, uh, I have a deep for work for a living, so I need a lot of I wonder if uh, we have a uh, have, uh, much knowledge, then it's the kind of things is, uh, that could help with the Thank you very much for your question. It's an excellent question. And you're the one, everybody, when you fly next time an airplane, you can remember the metaphor that I'm going to use now. All metaphors are imperfect, so bear with me. The knowledge that you're asking is necessary. But if we become attached to words and speech thinking, no matter how good that understanding is, it will hinder our progress. However, initially, we have to have something. Something that the mind takes hold on. Something that the mind can get off from, just like an airplane uses a runway. So in this metaphor, knowledge is this really thick, undivided runway which the airplanes use for taking off and landing. That includes all the ground equipment, all the control towers, all the people, all these little trucks and bigger trucks and very big trucks that are all around the airport. It's a fantastic dynamics as they work. You need all that. So I haven't seen a single person who would not have read even one book or one kind of sutra sometime during their practice. For some people it comes sooner, for some others it comes later. But what this knowledge you know, gives you is this conceptual map, the articulation of your practice. Why? Sometimes you need that knowledge to actually see what's happening inside the mind. So the runway is not just important when you start to practice, also when you have to land sometimes for fuel, for food, for exchanging passengers, that means changing times in your life and if you cannot land then you crash so being immersed in the unknown doesn't mean that you are without protection and that protection against your karma is the articulation and knowledge of your practice so sometimes you have to really know what's happening 
You have to know cause and effect. You have to see conceptually also what's going on in your heart, in your thinking, etc. Without that conceptual knowledge, you are vulnerable. But if you are attached to that knowledge, it's like the airplane that is on the runway, but there are these clamps, imagine these huge clamps that tie to the runway. So they pull the levers and the jets are full throttle and full power, but the airplane cannot move because people are attached to their ideas and although it can be knowledge, it's just thinking. So once you know your direction, once you know what you're doing, once you have done your two-dimensional, conceptual, dualistic inquiries, that means you have enough knowledge, you have to go to the runway, full throttle, and then your practicing jet takes off. <coughs> but you also need knowledge when you land. You also need, need knowledge during your change, changing times or in your critical times. However, without the flying experience, without the third dimension, without the transcendental knowledge, or I'm sorry, transcendental experience, everything on the ground can become your hindrance. Everything on the ground can lose its meaning. So you can see many people who are attached to knowledge and therefore they are like airplanes taxiing along the airport forever. But they never go to the runway and they never take off. They never dare to jump into the unknown. They never dare to ask the question, now what am I? And stay with the quadu. Because when you stay with the quadu, it's like keeping ailerons at the angle of taking off. And you keep the question, and you don't follow any thinking. You let your thinking be absorbed by the question. And that clears your mind completely. So when you do that, it's like getting higher and higher into the atmosphere with less and less oxygen, more and more light, and less and less turbulence. And at above 12,000 meters, there's barely any wind because there's not so much of air anymore. So this metaphor actually is precise enough that you can use it and see what you are doing. Many people believe they have already taken off and they are already flying in the stratosphere of no thinking, but they are actually just taxiing around the airport and getting some more food in this restaurant, and some more drink in that pub, and then a little bit into the airplane and say hello to the pilot and then get some good words over the microphone. You know, and then after one hour, they just get out of the same gate where they entered. So when you really take a deep breath and go, then of course you can practice together with other people, but your effort is there. You are on your own. You're not alone, not necessarily, but you are on your own. And you ask the question, you don't follow thinking anymore, because your direction is already clear, your effort is already being made. So that practicing effort is what will give you any kind of experience which is beyond thinking, which is beyond the two-dimensional world of dualities. And when that happens, then you are practicing. If you start to check yourself, and soon the plane starts to get closer to the ground again and again and again, and you're back on the runway talking into the intercom, I'm back, I did this, I feel like this, it was like that, etc, etc. So you start to define it, you start to articulate it, then you're landing again. No thinking, clear thinking. So, I always love airports, because it's being nowhere. It's not that airports are all the same, but it, it really teaches you something how you attain the third dimension with some aircraft. It's really, really heavily conditioned. How many people have to work together seamlessly without a mistake so that you could fly? So how much effort you really have to make and how lucky you have to be to really practice the true Dharma. It's much, much greater luck than just flying an airplane. So don't let's delude ourselves that thinking itself is practice, but also don't think that conceptual thinking is useless. See its role 
take the runway for the runway and take the airplane for the airplane. So fly the airplane and use the runway for takeoff and landing. Okay? You're welcome. More questions? Last few questions, Yoragun, and then you turn the aircon back on. I appreciate your stamina and endurance, I know it's nice. <coughs> From early teenage time, I wasn't interested so much. But you are, and that's not good, not bad. But tell me, just tell me, what's in the game? Like a special post. Special what? Special post. Post. Special post. Bon fighting. Bon fighting game. <laughs> See? I really don't understand. <laughs> so explain some more, then maybe I understand. <laughs> ah, special weapons, huh? And shooting. And you get points. And you kill the enemies. How long do you have to do that to make you feel better? How long do you have to do this so that your anger will disappear? Four hours. Three hours. Per day? Yes. That's heavy. You know? What happens if you don't do it? Very depressed. See? We call it dependence on projected violence. It's a projected, it's not real. You are, you're not killing people for two, three hours a day. I mean, have to know. But you project that into the mind through the computer game. So you're depressed, and if you are kind of deprived of this game for a long time, then you can also become very angry. So then depression turns into anger, right? So. When you, I mean, you already see that something is kind of out of balance here, and you want to change it. Let me tell you, you, you can't take it away. <laughs> At this point, you either do this and slowly change the game. So from war games, you go into strategic games. You go into empire building, but not so much fighting. Or you go into some other game which is less violent, but keeps your mind busy. Or you take a deep breath, you try to completely wash it out in sports, with other activities focusing on human beings, something that keep, gives more joy to the mind than a computer game. I'm being very simple here. We are joy-driven individuals towards happiness, fulfillment, satisfaction, and in the short run, we have to have something that gives that to us, even though we know that it's illusory. If we don't have that, we can get depressed, we can get violent, we can get crazy, we can get all kinds of stuff, because suddenly there's this vacuum that deprives, de deprives us from this most basic human experience of life and relationships. And whatever comes through should be joyful enough that it's worth it. Sometimes even anger and violence can be very joyful because it speeds up your, your bloodstream, it gives you a hormonal kick, you know, from know various parts of the brain and it's very hard to substitute that but if you want to you can get rid of this 
It's not, your situation is not special. Most people of your age, most boys especially, they do the same thing as you do. I was shocked when I saw Korean middle school kids um, in game rooms. I was living in, uh, in the Kanguk area in, in Suyudong at Fagyasan. As you walk down to Yennal Paship Sabon, Hyunjia Pegushi So when you walk down to the bus, old 84, young 151, uh, then you see in Suyudong all these places where the kids are just, just flocking in. And they are like 10, 12 years old. They're before they have these huge game consoles and they put in the Obeg one and the later on the Chon on. And now I don't know how much it costs, but 15 years ago it was like that. So they keep their minds totally busy and off the usual beaten track of studies and family and friends, etc., etc. You should see if it gets out of balance. Nobody will tell you. Maybe your mother is sometimes worried or your father says you're not studying enough, whatever, but it's all external and you can always explain yourself away, right? And once you feel inside that it's out of balance, you have to do something. You can do two things. Change the game or drop the game. If you want to change the game, you make it less violent so you're not dependent so much on the, on the kind of violence-related hormones. And then you can also reduce the time. And some people are okay with this. It's, you know, those people whose, whose generation is not about games, but 10, 15 years ago it was about cigarettes or smoking. Either they could reduce it to a few uh, cigarettes per day, or just once or twice a week, where they completely took it away and reduced it to zero, but then they had to eat chocolate or they had to do something, you know, familiar. <laughs> yeah, they had to eat chocolate, but they had to have some kind of extra that substituted the experience of smoking. Or you can be the great hero and you cut it with one move, but then be prepared because you will revolt inside. There will be a serious repercussion. You idiot! What's wrong with I want my game back! You know, this kind of stuff. And you will, you will see these reactions from seemingly nowhere inside as you deprive yourself of your earlier pleasure. And you won't like it. But if you think long term, then you either reduce it or you cut it completely and then you take either some sport, some activity or some other thing as your primary focus. And I will give you one question. Anybody can use it. One question that will help you do this. Questions are better than these big orthodox statements, you know, that are kind of limiting your consciousness. One good question is better than 10,000 books, okay? And your question in this case can be, what do I really want? Be courageous enough to ask the question for yourself. What do I really want? I know you don't like it. It's okay. You may think it's a little too simple, or I cannot use it, or I cannot do much with it. What do I really want? So that's your applied quadru. The original quadru is, everybody knows, what is this? What is this that's playing? What is this that's asking the question? What is this that goes through life and death, etc., and all the experience? So this ige no shinga, or imoko, which helps you experience this don't know mind. That's a wonderful, generic, original quadru but you can apply it in many ways, in many situations. Some karma appears and you say, where does this come from? So you become honest. This anger, where does it come from? This desire, where does it come from? But you can also reverse it and what do I really want? That means where do I go with my life? What's my direction? Be courageous enough to ask the question from yourself or to yourself. That means you start to depend on your own Buddha nature and nothing else. It's in the Chonsukyong, Rabon, in the Thousand Eyes and Hands Sutra, that you will always depend on the Buddha mind. That's what it means. Depend on your own true self. That's the true Prajna Paramita, okay? The transcendental wisdom. So that's why it's so important to crack open the wall of your own opinions and projections 
and ask a question which brings you back to reality. What do I really want? And stay with the question, and not just for one way. Okay, I want to eat kakuksu. Finished. No, it's not finished. You eat kakuksu, that's good. But then when you make another decision after kakuksu, whether you watch TV, go to bed, or play another two hours of game, as you make that decision, ask again, what do I really want? And give yourself enough time to experience that. You can save yourself and others from a lot of trouble. Just because you allowed yourself to see clearly, you allowed yourself what we call the mind space of clarity. If your mind is loaded with crap, you're not clear. If you stop and look, okay? All traditions from Vipassana to Tibetan to Korean, Japanese, all kinds of traditions have the stop and look. Stop the mind, come back to the moment, allow mind space, this wonderful emptiness to appear, and in that emptiness your clear mirror starts to function and you can look and perceive. I'm not going to use all these Chinese, Tibetan, uh, Pali, Sanskrit words for this. You look it up yourself. There's plenty of books here. Stop and look, still and perceive. Okay? So this is really important. If you don't ask the question, it doesn't happen because you are on your own train or tank or airplane or rocket, whatever you use to get yourself to the purpose, to the goal. So stop and look, and you can do this with the question. Because the question stops this, this noise in the mind. And when you ask that question, wait for the answer. And if you believe in that answer, follow it. If you don't believe in that answer, throw it away and see what happens next. So that's true exploration. That's the beginning of some true practice, because you are honest with yourself. You are sincere. Just some practice in form, you know, it doesn't help. Just by the form, you don't get anything. So, Huang Byoksun in Huang Po, a wonderful student, Ma Jo, Ma Jo Sun Sa. So Zen Master Ma Jo, when he was a young monk, he was really practicing hard. So he went to a, a monastery, uh, you know, related place. I mean, it was, a, it was a cave, but it was related to the monastery. So people were going up there giving food to those practitioners that were practicing there. And Majo Sunyu was just sitting days in lotus and not moving, not doing anything. So, of course, word came that oh, this monk is wonderful. He's practicing really hard. So, at last, Huang Byok Sunyu was the Joshil at that time, the spiritual leader of the monastery. He said, okay, I'm going to take a look at this hard practicing goes up there and he asks Macho, really like Buddha, like statue, why are you sitting so hard to become Buddha, Macho says. So then, some of you know the story, Huang Yotsunim, from Zen Master Huang Po, grabs a roof tile which was hanging around the entrance, he starts to rub it with a stump is noisy. It was a lot noisier than this. Imagine this amplified, even stronger. And of course, Majosuni was taking it for some time and he shouted eventually. Hey, why are you rubbing that tile with that noisy rock? Why are you doing that? And then Innocent like a child, Ang says, I'm just making a mirror. And then Majo says, Are you crazy? No matter how long you are rubbing that tile with that rock, that doesn't make it into a mirror. Then Ang Gyoksunim just delivered his blow and says, No matter how long you are sitting, that doesn't make you Buddha. Majo heard that. Boom! Got in like so this does not mean that from next week when we have our meditation class we wouldn't want to sit <laughs> we want to sit 
And if we put so much effort into sitting as Majosunim is so one-pointed, you know, mind, and so much effort, just one good pointing out, as we say, pointing out by the teacher, helps you make the next step, and then your airplane really takes off. The jets really fire. And then you experience, you attain what you originally wanted. And then you and want and experience disappear. Gone. So if there's anything else, it's not what we want. Okay? So change the game. <laughs> Last question. to shout again. If you didn't get it first, you don't get it next. How can somebody explain this to you? Understanding doesn't help you here. I'm very sorry. <laughs> but you keep thinking, right? You keep thinking about primary points, so... Seriously? Say yes. it again. Sometimes you thought you were an idiot? Yeah, a Zen idiot. Oh, that's yes. very good. That Zen idiot means can't get some wisdom yeah. out of it. Go ahead. Oh, it's so good. If you get some result, you would have a problem. Good, very good. the question yeah. but not attached to the question yes if you're attached to the question you become a tape recorder which has only a very small mp3 file on it <laughs> then jump back to the beginning <laughs> <laughs> so then your practice is inert it's empty so if you use your mind correctly and the question will disappear as words. But the sense of the question, this clarity, will be there. So don't attach to Imoko, but use Imoko correctly. If you're attached to Huadu, you cannot get anything. Okay? Wonderful. I also appreciate the good and pointed question. Also your presence and attention for not just tonight's little bit you know, steamy and stuffy talk, but also for the four previous occasions. And besides my appreciation, I would like to offer all of you and anybody who was here and could be here you know, sometime later, that we will have a meditation class starting same time, same place next Sunday. Everybody's welcome. And we will be doing that until August 13th for the next six weeks. There will be no Dharma talk, there will be meditation instructions, sitting, and then some simple, uh, not formal question answer in, uh, during our usual snack time. What you bring, you have. Okay? 
that's true inside and outside as well. So thank you very much for your attention, a wonderful presence, uh, and I hope to see you soon.